I'll take you back there as well as I will in front. If you all sat up front, I'd get nervous. They're coming for me. <laughs> great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. I, uh, in a part of the series that I've just called Rebuilding His Altar, uh, you know, and I just keep adding part one, part two, part three. I'm at part seven, but online, if you were to go online and, and look this up, this would be the community of his altar. Um, two weeks ago, we, we landed on a principle of scripture that opens our understanding to this fact that true worship, and when I say true worship, I'm referring to what Jesus said in John chapter four, and he speaks to the woman at the well, and he says, God is looking for true worshipers, right? And so there's a worship that's not really worship to God. Like we might see it as worship, but if you go, God, how do you say it? He goes, nah, that's not worship. And we see it throughout scripture time and time again. God says, why do you trample my courts? Why do you, why do you make your sacrifices? They mean nothing to me because there's no heart in them. And so true worship has the heart of God, right? And so uh, true worship True God worship at his altar, right? And, and, and when I say the word altar, we're talking about worship. And I just give you a little principle that, that brings me to that. There's a couple of things that could happen in an altar in, in God's economy. One was you could make a sacrifice. And what were sacrifices for? They were for sin, right? That was, that was the... That was the altar worship that was prescribed, and the sacrifice was always for sin. But yet, when, when God begins to talk about their sacrifices, here's what he always says, and that is, I desire obedience, not sacrifice, right? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Why? Because when I walk in obedience, obedience is an offering, and that's the other thing that you could bring at an altar was an offering. And an offering was of thanksgiving. It was of rejoicing. It was of celebrating the goodness of God. And so God says, I value your offerings more than your sacrifices because offerings come from obedience. Sacrifices come from sin, right? And so God says, listen, if you want to do true worship at my altar, then bring your offerings, right? Right? I, I'm not pleased with the blood of bulls and goats that need to take away sin, but I rejoice when my people live by this principle. Those who um, are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land, right? That's the promise. And so we, we brought all of these principles in. So true God worship at his altar, this, this willing free will offering will always position us will always position us to grow and harmonize with others in a healthy form of community. And so we examine how when other altars get erected, right? And, and let me take this back. The devil has a scheme, right? And, and Paul says, don't be unaware of his schemes. It's the same scheme he's been running since the Garden of Eden. It works so well in paradise that he's continued to use it throughout history. And that is to drag us away, offer us shortcuts, get us worshiping at other altars, right? He goes, it's okay. You can still have an affection for God. You can still have an allegiance with God. But if you really want to get what you want, then you get it quicker over here, right? It's what Satan offered to Jesus in the temptation. Hey, you know what? Just, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all this. But Jesus already knew, if you read Psalms 2, that God had already given him the kingdoms. But what Satan was offering was a shortcut. Do it my way. You're an ambitious fellow. Worship me. He was after worship. He's after our worship. The shortcuts are about worship. He's always been about, when he got thrown out of heaven, he was trying to take worship, something that didn't belong to him. And he's never stopped doing that. That's the scheme. Now, we've been going through all this. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing all this back in because you got to get this. I, I just, I thought about this again as I was preparing for this. I'm like, God, this is kind of hard to teach sometimes. Like this, this feels this feels heavy, but God goes, it's not about beating people down and getting people in their place. It's about recognizing the scheme. It's about recognizing the trap because God is trying to set us free. And, and one of the worst things that happens is sometimes 
you know, a message like this comes and we begin to recognize something in our life. And rather than seeing it for what it is, it's like, man, that's, that's the trappings of the enemy. We kind of glass over it and we begin to make excuses for why it's that way. Well, it's okay in my life because of this. No, 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 no. It's the scheme. It's the scheme. If you can see parts of it, it's there, right? Pay attention. Don't glass over it and make it okay because God comes to what? Set us free. He comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so when you look over the landscape of your life and you begin to see these things, pay attention. Why is it that each one of us individually can reason that we're a special case? Anybody ever do that? Yeah, I know that happened to a thousand people, but that's not going to happen to me. Yeah, I know this happened a hundred times in history, but that's not going to happen. It's okay. I'm in control, right? Have you ever said that? Have you ever said no, 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 I'm only going to do this for so long. No, no. If you see it, and it's the scheme, get out. And I, I think it's very interesting. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, 25 and 26. And actually, he's talking to Timothy, and he says, a, a, a teacher, a pastor, one of those people must be, you know, not quickly offended and, and all of those things. He says, but they must be able to teach because there's people who are caught in a snare, he calls it Satan's snare, Satan's trap, and he goes, teach with gentleness so they might come to their senses, right, see the scheme for what it is, and be set free. That's why we teach the word of God, because the scheme of the devil is against you. You're not special. You're just like everybody else, and he's out to get you. And, And it's a long way from where you are, to where you're going, and he's in no hurry to get you. If he can get you a little at a time, right, that's all he needs. And that's, what, that's how his schemes work. It's like, not like he just shows up with a bulldozer to push the house over. All, sometimes it feels like that. But a lot of times when those moments come, he's been scheming for years to position us for that moment so that he has the ability to push the house over. Because what does God say? He who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a person who builds their house on the rock. And when the storm comes, it won't push you over. But he goes, he who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them is a person like builds their house on the sand. You might take years to build that house. And it might stand there for 30 years. But when the storm comes, what's going to happen? It's going over. It's going over. And that's the warning. Like, that's how the schemes work. So pay attention as you see this because God clues us in. This is how your enemy works. And a scheme is exactly that. It's not obvious. That's why the devil uses it. It looks so good. It looks like it's got to be right. And when we lean on our own understanding, that's where we land, right? And so we've been talking about God's altar and community because there's a uh, there's another pandemic in the church, and that is that my relationship with God is a standalone thing that I can do by myself if I want to. That's part of the scheme. That's part of the scheme. Satan wants you out of community. He wants you out of community. You want to know why? Because God created the community. Look at the church of Acts. That is the genesis of the church. And they were all together. You can't find anywhere in there where there's a bunch of individuals out doing their own thing. You can't find anywhere where it said, oh yeah, and they all just did their own thing and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. You find that in the book of Judges. You're not going to find that in the church of Jesus Christ in the genesis of the church, in the book of Acts, where it was the way God wanted it, right? That was the closest it's ever been to what God intended. And and there's been a huge drift, right? But God calls us back because his faithfulness is greater than our brokenness, right? And so we've, 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 we've kind of landed on this like, wow, worship at God's altar always brought people together. It always brought people together. Other altars always spread people out and got them apart. And and we saw that in the nations that God drove out before Israel. It said that they had their altars under every green tree. Like everybody had their own place. They went and did their own thing. Everybody's after what they want. You know, and, and you see it in Israel. It happened to Israel. They still had this allegiance with God, but they had all these other altars. And we read they ended up exactly like the nations that God deposed and and drove out. And so they were also taken out, which was the promise that God made. If you give in to the scheme, like there's a price to pay. 
there's a price to pay. And so that's why he warns us. So um, the, the, the place that we landed, like, like true worship, will always happen. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have times individually where, where we meet with God. That's very important. It's called my, my, my personal relationship with the Lord. But my personal relationship with the Lord, nowhere in Scripture can you find where my personal relationship with the Lord trumps God's command to be a part of community. From the beginning in Genesis, what did God say? It's not good that you be by yourself. Right? He wasn't just talking about man and woman. He was talking about, I built you for community. I built you to be together. Uh, something, we're going to see something very interesting as we get into that, especially if I get moving. So uh, this is the very substance of the answer that Jesus gives when he was questioned about the greatest command. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 39. Jesus is being questioned, and, and the And the man says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Right? Right? Very personal, isn't it? It's personal. It starts out personal, doesn't it? But the personal takes you someplace, and Jesus goes on, and he says, this is the first and the greatest. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus said, if you're going to love God, you got to be in community. You can't love God by yourself. I, I always get a kick. People go, I don't, I don't need a community. I can go out in the woods. Yeah, you can, but you're in disobedience to the word of God, and it's not going to work out. You weren't created for that. God did not make you. God could have done it different if he wanted to. He's God, but this is the plan he chose, so operate in the plan, right? If you say you love him, what did Jesus say? He said, what would flow out of love? Obedience flows out of love. That's how we know it's real love. Oh, God, I have a heart to obey you. I I don't show you that I love you by my obedience. Obedience flows from a heart of love, right? And there is no fear in love. And John says that his commandments are not hard. They're not burdensome, right? Right, amen, pastor. Good, preaching, all right. Uh, Loving God includes loving the diverse community of people God has placed me in. But it starts here. It starts here. Where does judgment start? With the church. Right? And I'm going to show you that our effectiveness out there is directly linked to our effectiveness here. Right? It, scripture tells us that. That's why it's so important. That's why, that's why Satan fights so hard against community, against family. Right? And, and you've got to see the scheme. Because so many times we recognize some of these markers and we go, oh, it's okay, that's not what's really happening in my life. Scheme, scheme, don't you see it? It's just a trap. Like, do you know what a bear trap looks like? All right, do you want to step in one? Well, no, but look at all that pretty brush right there. I just want to pick those berries. No, there's a trap in there. No, it's the berries. It'll be okay. <laughs> ah! Sorry. It's the trap. Stay out of it. Stay out of it. All right. Just say, keep moving, Pastor. Keep moving. You're stuck. Keep moving. All right. Uh, John 13, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Look at this. Look at this. Jesus said this, a new command I give you, love one another. Can you do that by yourself? No. You know, Jesus, right before he leaves, says the most important things he can say. He says, a new command I'm giving you. This isn't some random thing that he says. It's very intentional. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He laid down his life. So you must love one another, right? Do you find in there any place it's okay for me to just, you know, have my relationship with Jesus and believe, and then the community of faith can just, you know, kind of have a little place in there? No, no. This relationship always leads us to the community. That's where it always takes us. Always has, always will. Look at what verse 35 says. It's talking about the people outside of the community. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I'm amazed how many people have a belief, they have a relationship with God, they want a disciple, but they have no community. 
What did Jesus say? He said, they're going to know you're my disciple, not because you know a lot, but because you've put it into practice in a community. Right? Knowing means nothing if it's not applied. Faith, without accompanying works, is dead. It's worthless. If I have all wisdom, but have not love for my neighbor, it's worthless. (laughs) True worship always leads us to community. Always, always, always. And the scheme of the enemy is to get you out of community. Why? Because your faith is worthless if it's not being practiced in community. Faith was not given for you to have to yourself. That is not why Jesus died. I'm going to show you this. Let's keep going. Say, so keep going, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. I guess you guys are all right if I just stay here. All right. Being truly effective and loving the community at large is a direct result of the health of our community here. When Jesus looked at his disciples and said, go and make disciples, right? He didn't just say that to a group of individuals. He said that to a group, a community of disciples, and Jesus prays for them. We're going to look at that, and then Jesus prays for us. We're going to look at that, okay? So the scheme of the devil, your enemy, that is set against God's design and purpose for life, Right? That's, he's, he's the enemy goes, you know what? I'm, I've, I've set this scheme against God's design and purpose. God's design and purpose is redeem us so that we can love him together. Right? That's why we're called the bride. Each one of you are the body of Christ, members of it individually. Right? So that's the picture that we're given. The body of Christ is made up of a group of individuals harmonizing together. That's our vision statement harmonizing together in his service, looking forward, creating a greater capacity for God, right? That's, that's what we want to do. And so the enemy has set the scheme. The first place he has set the scheme against um, is with your community with God. And if you look at scripture, if you look how God created, he created man to have uh, fellowship with him, then fellowship with one another, you know, in the family, he created the family next. And then he created the community. And so that is typically the order that the enemy attacks because if he can compromise or get you to compromise your fellowship with God, right, all the others, the others just fall in line. They just fall apart. Well, if he can't get that, maybe he's going to go after your community with your family because when the, as the family goes, so goes the community at large, Right? And if he can't get that, then he's just going to do his best to separate you from the community at large. And if he can do that, again, he's won, because this is where our individual faith and our family is always leading towards, is this community that God has created. And that's why he says, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here on earth, just like it is in heaven, right? And uh, so anyway, all right. So we must recognize his scheming and stand firm, submitted to God, operating in his plan. And I I just put here, I reiterate, if you identify something in your life that looks like this scheme of the devil, don't fall off into shame or make excuses for why it's okay. Just recognize it for what it is and repent, right? In repentance and rest is your salvation. But he says to Israel, but you would have none of it. But you would have none of it. Very unfortunate. Um, But I find that the compartmentalizing of God into just my personal relationships makes room for so much of this. And and honestly, the devil doesn't care if you just have a belief system and a relationship with God as long as you keep it to yourself. (laughs) As long as there is an offense enough to keep you separated from a community, he doesn't care what you have because he's made you ineffective. Ineffective. And when one part hurts, what does Scripture say? The whole body is affected, right? It's, man, through and through Scripture, we see this picture of the bride, of the body, of of individuals harmonizing together and becoming united, united. And and that's that's God's plan. 
That's God's plan. Um, God is wanting to set his children free from the traps of the devil so they can have life and have it to the full. And so this past week, I, I had a thought that made the... Um, a thoughtful moment, I should say, um, about the, the devil's hatred and scheming against the community of faith, very real, in a way that we can all understand because we've probably all seen it in our lifetimes, or many of us have anyway. Um, I was just, I was thinking about this, and it's, uh, if, you've, if you've been um, around the church very much, or there's a kind of a Christianese question um, about if you would give up your life for your faith. Like if somebody brandished a weapon and said, renounce Christ or you're going to die, what would you do? And I think most people honestly inside lean towards go, I, I don't think I would renounce my faith. I think, I think I would stand fast in that, right? right? And we see that once in a while, don't we? We hear about martyrs. People that have died for their faith. But I want to say something. That, as much as that happens, that is not the substance of the scheme. Right? That's not, I want to, I want to talk about what happens far more often, and especially in places where people are martyred. I want you to see what's more effective than that. Okay? And so I, I just had this thought. I'm thinking about this, and this thought came to me. One of the first things that Karl Marx said must happen for communism to succeed was that the community of faith must be done away with. Now we're talking about communism, right? And I would say that socialism runs in the same vein because it takes us away from dependence on God and brings us to another altar of dependence on somebody who will give you all these things, right? <laughs> it's the same thing. That's why communism and socialism run hand in hand. But Karl Marx was, we got to do away with the community of faith. And every country that has ever touted communism as a state of the nation has raged against the community of faith. Now, it's very interesting that an individual faith kept to oneself is acceptable in these countries. But when a community begins to gather it is harassed and suppressed with a vengeance quickly. So there is, there is no uh, harassment against an individual's faith as long as it's kept to itself. But if you are going to gather as a community, and I will tell you, Satan is behind it. Why? Because he rages against the community of faith in free countries and in communist countries. It just looks different. But if you want to see what it looks like when... Satan gets the upper hand in leadership. They will rage against community of faith. And isn't it so true that we hear in America, well, that's fine if you have your belief as long as you keep it to yourself. No community, no community, no community. Why does scripture tell us? Beware as you see the day approaching that you do not forsake the community of faith. Because you're going to need it. Because you're going to need it. Because it's the way God intended us, not only in bad times, but in good times. Um, and so this made me think more deeply about this Christianese of, 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 you know, if somebody brandished a weapon and said, denounce your faith or I'm going to shoot you. And most of us would say, hmm, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd, probably, I'd probably lay down my life. But here's a more real question. Here's a more real question because this aligns with the scheme. This aligns of how it happens here in our country probably maybe more than others, but you see it in other countries and you'll see far more times this is the weapon that is used to get people out of community. So, if someone asked you, consider this question. Consider this question. Either we will take all your worldly possessions if you will not renounce your community of faith. What if they said that to you? Hey, give up your house and all your possessions or give up your community of faith. Now what's your answer? Hmm, that one's tougher in America. 
You know, we saw it in COVID. We did. I saw it. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, everybody says they have this great love for God, but when it comes to his community, I can take it and leave it. And if it's going to cost me something, I'll leave the community. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? In the last days, the love of the great community will grow cold. Oh, it's here, folks. It's the scheme. It's the scheme. He's not out to take your life. He just needs to get you out of community. And you know, isn't that, that, that's the scheme. That's, that's where it becomes real. That's the question you got to answer. Somebody walked up to you and said, you know what? If you don't renounce your faith, we're going to take away everything you have. Or and more than that, if you won't leave the community of faith, we're going to take. If you keep it to yourself, that's fine. Think about that. Oh, if I keep it to myself, I can love Jesus and have all my stuff. Uh, where's, where's the offering? What, what, what does that cost you? Nothing. How real is that? Not very real. Right? It's the scheme. It's the scheme. It, it isn't a beat down. It's just like, do you recognize the scheme? Can you see how the enemy works? Can you look in your life and find pieces of that? Because he's after you. He's after you. Uh, but, 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 but nothing. No sanctified mooning. Right? You'll get that later. All right. Anyway, I'm trying to break the monotony in the, in the ice. I, I see it in my own life. I go, wow. God, how would I answer that question? Would I rationalize and compartmentalize you? Now, I can't after I see what I've seen about God's love for his community and that I cannot simply go off and live this faith by myself. I'm called to be a part of community, and that community is as much a part of the faith as the individual belief that I have in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Because this is where he works, and this is what he does. And you can't find anywhere in Scripture where God told people to go off and just do it on their own. You can't find anywhere in Scripture where God told people to go off and hide. He said, no, a light cannot be hidden under a basket. It must be seen. And you want to know where we shine the greatest? In community. In community. All right. Uh, and, and I believe a lot of this, and, and, and honestly, if you go to other countries where communism and where faith is suppressed, that tool is used far more than anything else. Hey, you're going to lose everything if you keep hanging out with that group of people. And you want to know what they do? They give it all up. That's why they see miracles. <laughs> because it's real. Because it's real. Right? I mean, I got, when I ask, do you understand that when I ask a question and I have to ask myself, what has your faith cost you in the last year? I can't answer that very well, right? Why? Because most times my stuff and what I have means more to me than the community of faith. It's a scheme. It's a scheme. I just got to see it, Right? I just got to see it. If I can see it and understand it, what can I do? I can repent. I can go, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I want the life. I want the full life you have for me. Help me to move towards it full steam and not be caught in this trap of the enemy. So if the question is ever put to me, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to be ready. Because isn't that what Jesus said the last days would hold? Man, the book of Hebrews, right? The writer of Hebrews encourages them. They go, man, don't give up your faith because many of you at the beginning suffered gladly the seizure of all you had. He goes, don't, don't give away your confession of faith now, right? Now that you've gotten a little more comfortable, right? Not a fun one, but I want to recognize the scheme. If there's a scheme set against me, I want to know where it is. You want to know why? Because I want to finish well. It's not enough to start. We need to finish well. God's looking for people to finish well, right? He's looking for a bride that finishes well without what? Spot or wrinkle. Spot or wrinkle, man, I'll tell you what. The devil is trying to take away your oil of old lady. <laughs> All right. His scheme is to destroy the God's bride. 
So I, I have a question, and I, and I want to I bring this in, because I want you to see, this isn't just something I'm pulling out or just a soapbox. This is something that was so important to God, it's so important to Christ, that it is one of the very last things that we see in his ministry. And I had this question, I mean, people go, man, I wish I could have walked with Jesus. I wish I could have walked with Jesus. I mean, how many of you would like, like to have had him lay his hands on you and pray for you, right? Like, man, if Jesus would have just prayed for me, things will be different. Well, surprise, he did pray for you. He did pray for you. And uh, uh, I, I think it's interesting because I, I kind of preface this with, what if Jesus could pray for you, but you couldn't tell him anything, right? You just had to walk up and let him pray for you. I'd be comfortable with that. I think, yeah, if there's anybody that ever knew what was coming, anybody that ever knew how to pray, anybody that ever knew how to pray God's kingdom over me would be Jesus. He'd know exactly how to pray before I ever said a word. <coughs> well, that's exactly what he did. Before we ever had a chance to say one word or even acknowledge him, he prayed over us. He prayed over us. And I want you to see this. I want you to see what he said. So in John chapter 17, this is, many people call this Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is the prayer that he prayed right before he went to the cross. Right before he went to the cross. And John recorded this for us. And so Jesus, I'm going to start in verse 9. Read verse 9, 10, and 11. Then I'm going to go down to verses 20 and 23. So in verses 9 through 11, Jesus is praying for his disciples. And so his disciples are the beginning of what? The church. They are the small group. They are the small community that is the seed of the church. And so Jesus prays for them. Look at what he says. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things are mine, are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. So he's talking about his disciples. I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you gave me, that they may be what? One, even as we are one. So that one, right, a community, that they would be one, even as we are one. Isn't it interesting that God, Jesus himself, compares the community of faith to the Trinity? That they might be one as we are one in the Trinity. You think this is important? You think this is some side note to Christianity? That there would be a community and a oneness and a unity that God looks for to show who we are? Because that's who shows who he is. The Trinity, this great mystery that nobody's figured out yet. And everybody you talk to has got a little bit, I don't know why, it's a mystery because it's a God thing. And I'm telling you, a community is a God thing. And Jesus says that they would be one, that they would have the tightness and the unity and the mystery that the world can't figure out the same way we do because it's what people are drawn to. So he prays for his disciples this way. Jesus prays for that small community of faith that they would be one. Now, let's go to verses 20 through 23. Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. And so now he's praying for us. That they may be, everybody say it, one, even as you, Father, are in me and I am you. He's talking about the Trinity again that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Why does the world believe? Because we are one, the way they are one. And they are in us and we are in them. He's going to say it again. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one. Anytime a writer of Scripture says something more than once, you better pay attention because it's like big exclamation marks. Just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now, if you have ever wondered if you really need to be involved in a community of faith, aka the church, settle your questions here. Verse 20 offers some very interesting insight as to how God sees things. 
Verse 20 draws up a paradigm that must be noted. Jesus prays that those who believe would be moved by their belief into a oneness with others. Isn't it interesting? Jesus did not pray that those who heard the message would believe, does he? He just says that those who believe, right, that their belief isn't enough. It's not enough to just believe and keep it to yourself. It's not enough to just have it by yourself or in a teeny little group and like, I'm just going to do this, just us and God, and then, you know, all the rest of this is just for us. He prayed that those who believed would live it out through the oneness of community, that they would apply their believing in community. That's what he prayed. Did he not? Now, you can go study that, and if you think I'm wrong, you can come back and let me know. That's what he said. And I, and I want to say, don't confuse oneness, because I'm going to use that word. Don't confuse oneness with sameness, okay? Uh, oneness is diversity harmonizing together in the worship of unity. That's oneness. Oneness is, I'll say that again, is diversity harmonizing together in the worship of unity. Jesus prays this over you. The scheme of the devil is to move you as far away as possible from this from happening. He's going to give you all kinds of other things to do, and, and you're going to rationalize it, or he's going to offer you the, the rationalization. Well, you, you've got a relationship with Jesus. What you need to say is, yeah, that's not enough. That's not enough. My relationship with Christ is moving me towards community and the community of faith, and God is calling me to make offerings with that community on his altar. And by that, the world is going to know that we're his disciples. You're not a disciple because you know stuff. You're a disciple because you practice what he said. <laughs> I like that because it works on me too. Works on me too. All right. Um, Jesus prays this over us. Um. Where does Jesus pray that believers would be perfected? Verse 23, I already alluded to it. In the worship of unity. That's where he says we would be perfected. Do you know you can't be perfected off by yourself? It's easier, right? What separates us from community most of the time? Offense. So it's easier to not be around people because I, I don't tend to get offended when I'm not around people, right? <laughs> That's, that's why I love, if you've never seen the John Bevere series, The Bait of Satan, oh, I would encourage you. I, we have it here at the church if you want to take it and watch it. Man, it will smash your toes so flat. Because he talks about the bait of Satan, which is offense, which is designed to destroy the community that God's trying to put together, right? And it's why Jesus in prayer says, forgive us the way we forgive, right? That, that's a community statement, isn't it? So many times we take that as individual, oh, I need my prayers forgiven. But it's like, or I need, yeah, I need my prayers forgiven too. I need my sins forgiven. But it's like, God, forgive me the way I live in community. Huh. You know, if I'm off by myself, I do pretty good. Put me in a Walmart parking lot and I start praying. All right. God bless Walmart. Um... Where did Jesus pray those outside his kingdom would see his majesty and love? Verse 23, in the worship of our unity and community united. That's where Jesus prays that the world would see his love. That they would know my love because they see it in you together in community. And is it any wonder Satan fights so hard against community? Jesus prayed for community. This is how he ends his ministry is praying for the oneness and unity of the body that would follow after because he knew that Satan was going to rage against it. This is what his death and resurrection made possible. Not just a bunch of individuals running around doing their own thing and everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. Community. Community. Jesus was so bold in this prayer as three times he compares our oneness as a community with the mystery and sacred community of the Trinity 
of God. Three times. He says that they would be one as we are one. This is no side note to faith. This is the heart of faith. You know, it takes faith to be in community. Doesn't it? It takes a confidence in God's character. Why? Because community is hard. We're not called here because it's perfect. Do you know that? So many times when I, when I was a children's pastor, I was always trying to recruit people. There's always more work to be done. There's always more kids to be touched and ministered to. But I would tell people when they come, I go, why are you here? Well, I see that there's a need. I go, well, that's nice, but that's the wrong answer. Why are you here? Has God called you to this community of people? Because we're a community within the community. Well, I don't know. I go, well, you need to know. You need to know. Because if you don't know that you're called, what's going to happen is one of these days, you're not going to like me. You're not going to like something I say. You're not going to like something I ask you to do. And you need to know why you're here. You need to know that God called you here, planted you here, and asked you to bear fruit. And there's going to be some diversity that comes with that and adversity that comes with that. But if you know that God put you there, you'll stay. If you don't know that God put you there, then you'll go, well, this is no fun anymore. And you'll pull up your roots and you'll, you'll dwarf and you'll go plant yourself someplace else. It's not where God wanted you. It's where you wanted you. Because you don't know the value of community and you don't know that God places each member as he wishes. Where's he going to put you? He's going to put you in community. You want to know why? Because you can grow there. Because you're going to be challenged there. Because you're going to get to practice faith there. You're going to get to practice love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, forgiveness. Woo-hoo, all those things we pray for. In community, in community, in community. Um, Jesus lets us in on a big kingdom secret. I want you to see this. I got a passage of scripture I'll close with. Where I want to bring us out, sets us up for next week. Oneness and unity are a portal, are a portal through which God does business. In verses 21 and 23, Jesus alludes to the idea that oneness is a two-way portal through which we participate in God and he participates with us. When he talks about that they may be in us and we may be in them. Oneness and unity is a, is a portal. So now let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Verses 19 and 20, I don't have it up. I'm going to read it to you. Listen to what Jesus said. And again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Look at here. We're, we're going to get the Trinity involved again. For where two or three have gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Community is a portal through which God does business. So all this individual faith, Whatever I ask for, I can have. Throw that in the trash. Get in community. Where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus says, I'm paying attention. I'm going to show up. The Father's listening. I'm listening. The Spirit of Christ is with you. Like the Trinity shows up when the community of God gets together. You want to know why this is not the only thing we do, but you want to know why Sunday is such an important thing because the community of God comes together in his name to worship, to offer up, and he shows up in a way that you're not going to experience in your personal prayer closet. That's just the way it is. It's the way God intended it to be, right? There's a reason we do this. But this is also not the end of all of it. This is where we get charged up so we can go out. And even though we're separate, what did Paul say? Even though I'm separated from you, I was there with you in spirit, right? And, and, and we operate in the kingdom of God outside of this place all week long. Praying, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. God, let us operate in the strength that you provide as we meet together and worship you in your presence, this fullness of joy. I love it. So, so we have that, that this, this community and this unity, it's a portal through which God operates. And there are certain things that if you decide to separate yourself from community, you are not going to experience in God. Right there, right? 
oh, I'm special, I can still have it. Yeah, yeah, you can still have it, all right. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. So this, is, this seems to be disconnected, but I want you to see this. This sets us up for next week. Look what Jesus said. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And so very quickly you see an altar. Okay, all right. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I chose to close with this for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is... Uh, it sets us up to begin to consider God's altar next week because we have two altars right here. There's two altars. You've got to see the altars. Jesus said, don't, don't worship at this altar. Worship at this altar, right? This is, this is, this is storing up here. This is taking care of business here. This is only looking, looking out for what happens here. He goes, don't do that. He goes, look, look towards eternity where you're going to live forever and store up there. Worship at that altar. Worship at that altar. This altar... You can do whatever you want because it's just you. This altar requires us to lay down our life because we're in community, right? This altar is easy. What did Jesus call the wide road? It's easy. A lot of people are going to take it. But he said, my road, the road I want you on, it's more narrow. It's more difficult, constricted by pressure. Not a lot of people are going to want to walk it. That's what he said. He goes, but you need to recognize it. If it seems a little difficult, look around you go, yeah, I think maybe God's strengthening me for this, right? So anyway, so it, it sets us up. We've got two altars. So, it, and, and this passage is really the reality of the portals of two altars. Um, Jesus tells us to offer to God, who takes our offerings and stores them for us in heaven, as opposed to offering on altars of the world that just consume the gift and the giver. That's what the altars of the world do. They consume the gift and the giver. Jesus said, don't worship there. He said, worship over here because God will take what you offer and he'll put it in heaven. So it kind of begs the question, how does this happen? Like, what is an acceptable offering to God that he would actually take and store in heaven? What does that look like? Is it... Is it Dropping some jingle in the offering basket when it goes by? Is it, is it, what, what, what is it? What makes an offering acceptable to go to heaven? Because like not just anything gets into heaven, right? Right? Do you get to send your junk to heaven? No, if it's going to go to heaven, it's got to be an acceptable offering. God talked all the time to Israel. He goes, why do you bring me blemished sheep for an offering. He goes, why don't you just break a dog's neck and bring that? He goes, you wouldn't offer that to your earthly kings. Why do you offer it to me? So what's an acceptable offering that God is willing to take and store up for us in heaven? Well, as we've seen, God's altar does not exist in a community vacuum, right? And so God's altar creates community, and the oneness of community is the portal through which our offerings arrive in heaven. And so an offering that is acceptable to be stored up in heaven is an offering that is offered at his altar in community. I've often told people, why do you give? Why do you give? Um, you know, sometimes we you know, plate goes by and we give and why do you give? Well, I, I want to help the church. I want to do this. No, no, no. When you give, give to God. No strings attached. Give to God. With the intent of God, my desire is that this would be a benefit to your community. Right? But I give it to you. God, would you take this? Here it is. Do with it what you want. It's towards God, but it's for community. Those are the ones that God goes, yeah, I'm going to put that away. You're not just living for yourself. You're living for my kingdom, right? That's what makes the offering acceptable. It's not a selfish offering. Why did heathens make offerings on altars? To get what they wanted. Man, I've been guilty. God, I'm going to give in this offering because I got something I want done. God goes, huh? 
You think I'm a debtor to you? Come here, boy. <laughs> we need to talk. We need to talk. The devil goes, yeah, keep giving that way. Keep giving that way. Oh, God, with a heart of joy, I give to you. You've been so gracious. God, I'm but a steward. Show me your way so I can walk with you. Now, I believe, I, I've been wanting to talk about God's altar for so long, but I, I really, as I finish this, I believe that God restrained us from considering his altar worship together until we could understand that we cannot worship at his altar alone. I think that's the biggest would be the biggest mistake and the biggest stumbling block is to consider God's altar and then walk away and try to figure out how I could do this on my own. Rather than going, God, if I really want to worship at your altar, if I really want to escape and be set free from the trappings and the schemings of the enemy, then I've got to know that it's going to have to happen in community. This isn't something I can go off and work by myself. And, and that we begin to pray, God, help us. I mean, not only for, here first, here first, like if it can't happen here, it's not going to happen out there, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that scripture says that again and again, like, like not only is God going to judge us first, but he just, we saw two instances today. We had at least two witnesses that said that the world will know that Christ is real because of the oneness that we have in community. And again, oneness isn't sameness. Oneness is not without friction. Oneness is not without tension. Scripture talks about that. If you see your brother caught in sin, you can't do that if you're not in community. Confess your sins to one another. You can't do that if you're not in community. There's got to be sin to confess, right? There, there's tension. There's struggle. There's rub. But God told us that it'd be there, right? Right? It's, it's okay. We don't want to stay there. We want to grow. But when somebody comes and rubs you a little bit, instead of being offended, you go, man, maybe they love me. Maybe they're concerned about our community. Because you know what? God will not sacrifice the community to save one. Well, at the expense of one. Like he talks about leaving. Isn't that so funny? I had somebody tell me this. Maybe you heard this. This is age pastor. Shut up. Um, Jesus does the parable about the the one sheep and the ninety nine. He said there was, you know, or ninety nine. Actually, he says there's ninety nine righteous that didn't need him, but he goes out and saves the one. You want to know what's so funny about that? Is there's no such thing as ninety nine righteous who don't need him. There's just ninety nine righteous who think they don't need him. Ninety nine righteous who think they don't need community. Father, we thank you that you care about us. God, you keep coming after us. You are not content to let the devil, buffalo, blind, smokescreen, sham, scheme your people. God, you're not going to let it happen. You said, he who has ears to hear, he who has a heart to understand, understand these things. God, would you show us in our individual lives, as we look to you, God, we can only repent uh, individually first, but then as a group we can too. But would you show us in our individual lives how we can, in our faith, exercise in community? God, that we would not be content to just have a relationship that we have with you at 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning, and, and once at church on Sunday, and sometimes uh, done by 12.30 when pastor loses his wind. Would you help us, God, to move into the community that you saw when Jesus prayed? God, that we would be perfected in unity, that your love would become so real and burn so bright that our community could not help but see it. God, we love our community. You've placed us here. Show us your way so we can walk with you. God, help us. Give us the grace to love one another more deeply. God, not to try to fix one another, but just to say, I love you and I'm here to walk with you. I'm here to walk with you. Let's walk this out together. And God, that your love would grow in us so that 
God, all that we know would become effective and all the gifts that you place in our life would become effective. And God, all that we have to say would become effective because of the love that is in us for one another and for our neighbor. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, come and baptize us again afresh. Saturate our lives with your power and your presence to be knit together. We know that your purpose here is to knit together the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, that we would, God, flourish, and that the body of Christ at large would flourish because we're becoming healthy. Because when one is blessed, the whole is blessed. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for your calling us again and again. Convict us. God, convict us. Help us to see the scheme that is set against us. And God, rather than allowing shame or pride to get in the way, God, that we would just say, God, forgive us and lead us away from that trap. Thank you for for releasing our foot from the snare. Show us your way so we can walk with you. Give us a united heart to follow after you in the fear of the Lord. We thank you for all these things, and we give you praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen.